I think Armando's been a little concerned of, about what I might uncover uh, about him, uh, but unfortunately there's not much out there. So uh, it is an honor and pleasure to introduce to you the 75th President of the Society of Surgical Oncology, Dr. Armando Giuliano. It's been a true pleasure getting to know him over the last few years, uh, and I've come to know him as a highly intelligent, driven, committed individual who embodies greatness with kindness and humility. Dr. Giuliano, as you know, changed the paradigm of how the world manages the axilla in patients with breast cancer. He introduced sentinel lymph node mapping for breast cancer and studied its application from feasibility and accuracy to randomized controlled trials, proving that there was a less morbid approach than axillary lymph node dissection. In the course of his career, he's published over 500 manuscripts on breast cancer management, performed basic and clinical research, served as a master surgeon, an educator, mentor, and patient advocate. Uh, and he's won a number of awards, as you might imagine, for his work, including the Me Medal of Gold in Madrid, the Veronese Award in Italy, uh, and the Komen Foundation Award in America. He was recently named the Giant in Cancer Care by Onc Live. He has been a strong, uh, or he has uh, published in a, in a number of high-impact journals. Uh, here is the Journal of Clinical Oncology uh, for his randomized trial in, in JAMA. Uh, and he's crossed over into the lay lit literature. Here he's featured on the cover of New York Times uh, for his uh, lymph node work. And perhaps he's most proud uh, of this, the cover of the National Enquirer, uh, sharing time with uh, Michael Jackson and Marsha Clark. Uh, which he's quite proud of. He's definitely the uh, Hollywood surgeon to the stars. Uh, here he's pictured with Marianne Mobley, a former Miss America, uh, who was a patient of his and became a, uh, an advocate for breast cancer, uh, worked with Dr. Giuliani, Giuliano to, um, uh, to raise money and awareness for breast cancer. And uniquely, he is an Italian knight. He was knighted uh, in Italy uh, for uh, advancing uh, medicine and, uh, and holds that honor. So it's fun to kind of look back and see where all this began. So in actuality, uh, that's not Dr. Giuliano. <laughs> so I just Googled bald Italian kids uh, in suits. <laughs> And that came up, but that is exactly how I pictured him uh, uh, as a kid. But this is him. He was born in Long Island, New York, with a large Ita Italian family, three b brothers and two sisters. Uh, his father ran a tailor's shop and recruited Armando and his siblings to work in the business. Uh, it was here and from his father that he developed discipline and a strong uh, work ethic. Uh, he met uh, the love of his life in middle, middle school, uh, Cheryl Fallon. Uh, they were seated together uh, and enjoyed teasing each other and pulling her pigtails. And through that, they developed a lifelong partnership. Uh, and I think they've worked as a team and enhanced each other's careers over the years. Armando was the first generation of his family to attend college uh, and the only one of his siblings who went into medicine. He attended Fort Fordham College. Uh, and just an example of giving back, he's established recently uh, an internship program for Ford, Fordham students that are interested in medicine to come out and work with him at Cedar sinai um, His uh, wife, Cheryl, uh, was a liter literary ma literature major uh, and uh, was a, a talented writer uh, and I think helped him get into medical school by writing his medical school essays. So they, they kind of moved west. So from New York, they went to the University of Chicago, uh, she uh, obtained a Ph.D. in literature from the University of Chicago, uh, and I think in response to that, Dr. Giuliano became uh, Ernest Hemingway. So that uh, is just amazing to me. He hasn't changed a bit, though, as you can tell. Uh, he graduated from the University of Chicago Medical School, completed his surgical residency at UCSF, uh, his faculty job was at UCLA, uh, where he stayed for 11 years, rose to the rank of professor. He then moved to the John Wayne Cancer Institute, where he stayed for 20 years uh, with a variety of administrative titles, including chief of surgical oncology, chief of science and medicine. Uh, and for the last eight years, he's been at Cedar sinai chief of surgical oncology, CGSO fellowship director, executive vice chair of surgery, 
and Associate Director of the Samuel Ocean Comprehensive Cancer Institute. In 1970, uh, he and Cheryl were married. Uh, and once they got their careers established, they had two beautiful uh, twin children, uh, Amanda and Chris. Uh, and they've been an extremely close-knit family. The kids enjoyed traveling with him on his business trips. Uh, and um, they still get together, I think, every Sunday uh, evening for a large Italian dinner that uh, Dr. Giuliano cooks uh, as one of his favorite hobbies. And in case you're wondering if he ever lets his hair down, so to speak, <laughs> uh, here he is on a casual stroll with uh, Charles Balch uh, in the wilderness. Uh, he's been witnessed out boating. Uh, we had a wonderful sail with uh, him uh, on Dan Coit's boat up in Maine. And clearly he enjoys uh, goofing around with his family. So in summary, your president is an accomplished surgeon, a multitasker, <laughs> a patient advocate, a mentor, a statesman, esteemed investigator, uh, and most importantly, a humble family man. It is with honor that I introduce Armando Giuliano to give his presidential address entitled Serendipity and Strategy on the Path of Progress. Thank you, Dr. Bartlett. Was I ever really that young? <laughs> it has been an honor to serve as president of this esteemed society in what has been a transformational year. This organization has given me decades of great joy, friendship, and education. I have so many people to thank. People who helped shape my education, people who shaped my career, and those who helped me function as your president. I and the society have benefited greatly from our recent past presidents. These are all tremendous presidential leaders who taught me a great deal and with whom it was a pleasure to work. Over the past two years, I've spent at least an hour a week on the phone with Dave or Kelly or both. I appreciate their friendship and we all greatly benefited from their leadership. In addition, our executive council has worked hard and were a wonderful group for us to work with. They have all served the organization well. I must thank the surgical oncology faculty and laboratories who support me and cover for me when I am gone. They've done a great deal to help me get through the past several years. Vicki Norton and Fernando Esparza run my academic office and keep me sane. They've each been with me over 15 years I could not get my work done without them, and the fellows and residents know who run the program. I have been fortunate to have been involved in the training of many fellows and residents during my career. I often tortured them and then reminded them that should, they should thank me for their torture. Now I must confess and would like to publicly thank each and every one of them, the surgical oncology and the breast oncology fellows with whom I've had the pleasure to train and mentor. I thank them for making my job far more enjoyable and frankly, for teaching me more than I've taught them. They have all become skilled surgeons. Many of them have gone on to very distinguished careers. I am fond and proud of every one of them. When you get to know the staff at the SSO, you realize why this organization works so well. I'd like to commend and thank each and every one of them, especially the Karens, Karen Hurley, Karen Rahu, and Patty, Anna, Becky, Jeanette, and of course, our CEO, Eileen Widmer. The entire staff work so hard and do so much for all of us. You are wonderful people. You do outstanding work. Thank you. The family of every surgeon pays a price. Surgeon mom or dad's absence is always felt. My work has not always been easy for my family. My son Chris has said that my patients get the best of me and the family gets the rest of me. What busy surgeon's family has not at times felt that way? 
I seem to have missed the work-life balance lecture. My wife, Cheryl, has been tremendously supportive and loving since I met her in the seventh grade. Without her, my career would not have been possible. As Dr. Bartlett pointed out, in fact, without her, I may not have even gotten into medical school. It was she who typed my applications and helped with the essays. I assure you, the essays were very well written. Cheryl's PhD from the University of Chicago is in English, and she was director of the writing program at UCLA for many years. Thanks to their mother, my twins, Chris and Amanda, have become two wonderful young adults. I'm very proud of them, and I'm grateful for their love and support. Chris has been producing electronic music. You can hear him on Spotify. He will get his MBA next month. Amanda is working now and plans to start grad school next fall. She too loves music and sings with the Lolas, a group formed when she was a student at USC. No, I did not bribe anyone to get her in. In fact, the only crime I saw was the tuition they charged me. Preparing this address has led to much reflection looking at my family, the list of past presidents, and the talented people with whom I have worked, I realize how fortunate I am. My good fortune has been the result of good luck mixed with hard work, strategic planning, and plenty of serendipity. In case you are curious, the word serendipity is relatively new in the English language. In 1754, Robert Walpole the son of Britain's first prime minister, created the word based on a Persian fairy tale, the three princes of Serendip. Serendip was the Persian name for Sri Lanka. The three princes in the story would strategize and plan a journey in quest of treasure. The journey was always diverted, but the diversion would always result in finding an even greater treasure. Serendipity does not mean luck, as we often think. It means planning for one thing and then finding another, finding something better. The start of my career was, in fact, serendipitous. When I was a fourth year medical student at the University of Chicago, I planned to be a cardiologist. My wife, Cheryl, was a PhD student, and we lacked sufficient funds. I couldn't travel to visit residency programs. Fortunately, the Department of Surgery was paying fourth year students to be acting interns. I was assigned to George Block's service. His service was known to be physically and emotionally demanding. Emotionally demanding because George was gruff and often unkind to residents and especially students. I had no interest in surgery as a career and dreaded the rotation. But on service, I saw an extraordinary surgeon doing extraordinary work, treating patients with great skill and compassion. This was not the stereotype I had come to believe. That rotation inspired me, and I applied in surgery instead of medicine. Serendipity led to the start of my education in surgery. George and I stayed close for many years until he died quite young. One of the saddest honors of my career was delivering his eulogy at Murphy Hall of the American College of Surgeons. As an intern at the University of California, San Francisco, I met F. William Blaisdell, professor in chief at the San Francisco General Hospital. Bill Blaisdell was an outstanding surgeon and dedicated educa educator, and arguably the father of modern trauma care. The UCSF residency was then perambul. 32 residents would start in general surgery, and only eight would become chiefs. In my third year, Blaisdell called me to his office and told me that I would be going into the laboratory. I was extremely happy. Entering the lab meant you made the cut, you would be a chief. But the next thing he said was very disturbing. He had arranged, arranged for me to go to Donald Morton's lab at UCLA. I thanked him and said, uh, but Dr. Blaisdell, I want to be a vascular surgeon. Morton's a surgical oncologist. Blaisdell was not moved. He just said, you can do vascular later, and went back to his paperwork. 
I was really upset. Cheryl was working at UC Berkeley and was even more upset. We had to leave San Francisco for Los Angeles for a laboratory I did not want to be in. It was a long, unhappy drive. Among the many concessions I made on that drive, I promised to never move again unless it was for her job. Residents can't believe that's how I started in surgical oncology. But in fact, that's how it happened. In a pyramidal system, when the chief told you what you should do, you did it. Serendipity. In Los Angeles, Donald L. Morton, past president of the society, became my mentor, my colleague, and then a dear friend. Don had an extraordinary life. His father was a coal miner in West Virginia. As a teenager, he went to California alone, attended a state college, then Berkeley and UCSF Medical School. He became an extraordinary leader in our field. At UCLA, Don ignited my interest in surgical oncology, and his lab got me interested in research. He supported my career until the day he died. Don had tremendous intellect and vision. He predicted the value of immunotherapy for melanoma decades before it became a reality. Together, we left UCLA and founded the John Wayne Cancer Institute. Years later, even though he was dying of chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy, he supported my leaving John Wayne because he felt it would be best for me, a mentor to the end. Don Morton's impact on the practice of surgical oncology cannot be overestimated. There are many women and men in this audience whose careers and lives were changed by Don Morton. In 1956, Bernard Fisher was a young surgeon studying liver regeneration and transplantation. He received a call from I.S. Rabden, his mentor at Penn. Rabden, according to Fisher, commanded him to attend a meeting to discuss clinical trials for breast cancer. Dr. Fisher said he had no interest in breast cancer, but went because he was commanded by his former chief to go, a parallel to my own career. Out of that meeting came the NS NSABP and the first prospective randomized surgical trial in breast cancer. Fast forward three decades, when I began my career at UCLA in general surgical oncology, I experienced the common angst of trying to start a career in academic surgery. Like Fisher, I had no interest in breast cancer, but went to an NSABP meeting and was inspired by Fisher's leadership and ability to get practicing surgeons to contribute to clinical research. I was intrigued by the concept of randomized trials in people. While common now, they were unusual when I started my academic career. Thanks to Fisher, I began to contribute to clinical trials and the treatment of breast cancer. Recently, I was honored to be the Bernard Fisher Visiting Professor and to spend an afternoon with him in Pittsburgh. Bernie Fisher just turned 100 years old. God bless him and give him many more years. Early on, serendipitous events led me down paths quite different from what I had planned. However, the next tale I'll tell is less about serendipity and more about holding fast to strategy, beliefs, and values, despite obstacles and stairs to climb. It is through strategic, deliberate work that we can best, best effect change. Surgeons are skeptical. We must be changing practice and changing the, changing the ways surgeons think about a disease are some of the most difficult changes to accomplish in our profession. As you can tell by looking at me, I've been in surgical oncology for a long time. Many practice changes have occurred. Most of them have been initially resisted. Laparoscopic surgery, that's no good. You have to be able to feel tissue. Robots, really? Lumpectomy was at first considered inadequate. Mastectomy was essential. It took decades to accept breast conservation. Sentinel node biopsy, that will leave residual disease, residual disease leading to unnecessary deaths. I know a little about that one. My research in sentinel node biopsy was often a difficult and at times a painful experience. 
In 1991, Don Morton was investigating sentinel node biopsy for melanoma. I tried the same exact technique for breast cancer. I knew identification of a tumor-free axilla without an axillary dissection could greatly alter breast cancer management. After about 10 or 15 attempts, I became the first to conclude that sentinel node biopsy would never work for breast cancer. I told Don, this won't work. The parenchymal lymphatics must be different. Don just said, research. Armin, research means search again. So I kept trying. A surgical oncology fellow, Danny Kurgan, who is likely in this audience and is now a professor of surgery at the University of Nevada, came onto my service in a bar at the annual meeting of the American College of Surgeons on the back of a napkin Danny and I strategized and sketched a plan to identify a central node in breast cancer. We altered several variables and eventually created an algorithm that worked. I was really excited. It worked. I applied for a grant and was soundly rejected. Central node in breast cancer might turn out to be a magnificent tour de force, but without adding very much to the overall management of breast cancer. That was the response to my grant. But I kept trying. And once I began speaking and publishing, there was tremendous skepticism. There were questions about the accuracy or reproducibility of the technique and the veracity of the data. There was animosity towards the very idea of omitting axillary dissection from breast cancer treatment and towards me personally for proposing it. Many in this society felt the presented data was not accurate. SSO President Bill Wood visited me to observe some cases. It was a good day, things worked well. Bill became a great supporter, an ally, and a dear friend. Before we, they would accept the accuracy of the procedure, many surgeons then demanded a randomized trial for the central node negative woman. When past president Sam Wells asked for a study of central node biopsy for ACOSOG, I was very much against a node negative randomized study. Fortunately, others were too. Why randomize node negative women to an axillary dissection? Charles Cox and Doug Rankin, who ran a great course on the technique at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, were also against a randomized study. We strategized, and we convinced Sam Wells to let us do ACOSOG Z10, a prospective study evaluating the, evaluating the relevance of micrometastases. Even though many believed axillary dissection was necessary for patients with central node micrometastases, the Z10 study showed they have no clinical significance with modern breast cancer management. But the real struggle came with Z11, a randomized trial of axillary node dissection in women with a positive central node. I naively thought this would be an easy study to do. It was merely a high-tech repeat of NSABP B04 done in the 1970s. I felt confident that surgeons would support Z11 and that ACOSOG would be successful in involving more surgeons in clinical trials. I never anticipated the animosity towards the study, nor towards me. Some surgeons felt there would be ankuras, axillary metastases necessitating four quarter amputations. Others were reasonably opposed to leaving undissected cancer in the axilla. Many refused to participate in Z11. Some IRBs would not even approve the study and deemed it unethical. I have a collection of letters and emails describing my overall poor judgment and lack of ethics. At times, I questioned it myself. We could not have done this study if Sam Wells had not been convinced of the clinical science and if it did not have the support of many friends and colleagues. Former fellows were arm twisted into participation and randomized many of the patients. Even though 10-year results have shown no benefit of axillary dissection, many surgeons still view the study with skepticism 
and will not abandon axillary lymph node dissection. No surprise, it took decades to accept breast conservation. I am grateful to all the surgeons who participated in Z11 and to the 891 women brave enough to accept that a randomization. Other changes in life are even more difficult to accept than choices of one's career or results of clinical trials. My wife Cheryl's illness has been a painful and difficult change for the, for the entire family, but a change to which we must adapt. We all will confront changes we cannot control, we cannot affect. You have to adapt to go on. The SSO is changing, it too must adapt. Our profession has changed, our culture has changed. While many events in my career were serendipitous, the proposed SSO changes are strategic. I would like to present to the membership the strategic plan of the Society of Surgical Oncology, a plan thoughtfully, purposefully, and deliberately designed to enable the SSO to remain relevant and to fulfill its mission. A reminder, what is our mission? Our mission is to advance the science, education, and practice of cancer surgery worldwide. That's why this organization exists. That's why we are members. That is the goal of the society and the new strategic plan. Many members of the SSO will likely object and resist the changes proposed. However, progress can only occur with change. Change is not new for our society. We have adapted in the past. As you know, the society began as a memorial alumni society and shortly thereafter became the James Ewing Society, named after the director of Memorial Hospital. Decades later, the Ewing Society's leaders realized that to have greater impact and to more proudly, profoundly improve cancer care, the society needed to grow and be accessible to surgeons throughout the country. This realization resulted in the Ewing Society's name change to the Society of Surgical Oncology. But this simple change was greatly resisted. According to Blake Cady's 1989 presidential address, discussion of the name change was emotional with angst and turmoil. I can only imagine. But that change was necessary to position the society to support the profession with a greater sense of purpose and scope. The society grew as designed, but growth came primarily from academia. And in the late 1980s, the SSO had become almost entirely an academic organization, even requiring publications in oncology to be a member. The society stagnated forcing it to reflect on its role in the profession. How could the SSO advance surgical oncology? In his presidential address of 1990, Benjamin Rush stated, if the society intends to work successfully, it must represent most surgical oncologists. 1991 to 1994 were years of major strategic change, including a reorganization of the annual symposium, the administration, and membership requirements. Charles Balch, who has done so much for the SSO, and Don Morton, expanded the society with a recruitment drive and elimination of the publication requirements for membership. More cancer surgeons participated, and the SSO grew. Other dramatic changes were more recent, but equally strategic. In 2011, we adopted our current mission statement. In 2012, we went to self-management a risky but important and successful change. The SSO truly became a modern, full-service organization. We expanded educational offerings and began international partnerships. To ensure our viability and relevance in the future, in 2018, we initiated our new current strategic plan. A great deal of work was performed to develop this plan. We had a leadership retreat, collected data, consultants were hired, data reviewed, task forces appointed, and a plan was proposed, supported, and approved by leadership. This plan, like previous strategic plans, considers the needs and culture, 
of the members, changes in the profession, and the best path forward. Our new strategic plan emphasizes inclusion, transparency, and engagement. Inclusion is a powerful theme that affected changes at several points in the society's history, from changing the name to omitting publication requirements, changing committee structure, and opening leadership nomination procedures. Why must we change yet again? Most of us in this audience really like the SSO, but there are many reasons to change. We continue to lose members to specialty societies. Our surveys and task forces repeatedly show that many members perceive us as a purely academic society, lacking sufficient inclusivity and transparency, two concepts essential for our growth and success. In addition, our meeting has not changed. Despite changes in the educational needs of surgical oncologists, we have not changed. We plan to increase meeting attendance, increase membership, impact the community, and position ourselves more solidly on the world stage. Here's one change I guarantee everyone would like. The program committee has shortened the time for the presidential address. <laughs> A first step to make the meeting more interesting. <laughs> the strategic plan, which will transform the society, has six goals. Reimagine the annual cancer symposium, Grow a membership that is more inclusive of all cancer surgeons. Expand our global outreach. Further support education. Strengthen our brand image and maintain organizational vitality. All the goals go hand in hand. Each goal achieved increases the value and scope of the society. And all goals work together to improve and enhance our member experience. To enhance the annual meeting, a reimagination task, re task force was formed of 20 members from various career stages and practice settings. The task force evaluated years of data to recommend a more contemporary and engaging meeting. Some of their 28 recommendations are already in effect here, including enhanced networking opportunities, more interactive technology, and more presentations. There is even a human library where members can meet with a representative of a disease site group to discuss a challenging case. This is just the beginning of what will become an even more engaging symposium. Next year, our traditional exhibit hall will be replaced by the SSO hub. Our hallway conversations will take place in a comfortable community environment. The hub will be organized in disease-specific zones with case presentations, discussions, debates, and industry spotlights. An informal meeting place is often good for networking and exchanging creative ideas. Remember, in an informal atmosphere on the back of a napkin, Danny Kurgan and I planned the study that led to Sentinel Node's success in breast cancer. All members, young and old, academic and non-academic, will have an opportunity to feel included in the SSO. To that end, I have appointed a very diverse group of members to our committees. In the past, like other surgical societies, we have not been a model of diversity. Thanks to the nominating committee's comprehensive review of our membership, we have several more women in place to become society president. But we have more progress to make. The issue of opportunity bias is a topic I have taken very seriously. I have formed a diversity and inclusion advisory board with a diverse membership to be certain that the society provides equal leadership and engagement opportunities to all members. The advisory board chaired by past president Monica Morrow met last month and will advise the executive council to ensure that we capitalize on the strength of all our members. To grow and achieve our mission, membership must be representative of cancer surgeons from all practice settings and all locations. In the U.S., about 80% of cancer operations are performed in the community. For the SSO to significantly improve cancer care, we must support the needs of the community cancer surgeon. We will attract more community surgeon members while we continue to highly value 
and capitalize on the expertise and leadership of our academic members. Our strategic plan contains a membership drive and community outreach. I believe President Benjamin Rush was correct in 1990. Since our mission is worldwide, we must also engage surgeons abroad, especially in developing countries. Our strategic plan has specific ideas for increasing global outreach. The SSO will improve collaborations with our eight partner societies and increase international membership to engage surgical oncologists abroad. To provide a voice for the cancer surgeon on the global stage of medicine, the SSO convened the Global Forum of Cancer Surgeons. Under our leadership, this group of 12 international societies will meet again here. The SSO is a member of the Union for International Cancer Control. We collaborate with the European Society of Surgical Oncology and are creating a global training curriculum. Over 300 international surgical oncologists are here at this meeting. The SSO is known for premier educational programs developed by our academic leaders. Our fourth strategic goal is to further strengthen education. Our education council is focused on supporting career-long education and quality care. By the end of this year, the council will have produced nearly 50 new educational programs. These will be found on our new learning management system, Expert Ed at SSO. To be effective, we must maintain the organization's infrastructure. The operational elements and needs of the society are important components of the plan. Our CEO, Eileen Widmer, who works tirely, tirelessly for the organization, works with the Executive Council and the Finance Committee to ensure operations and infrastructure function well and within budget. A final important goal is development of our brand. What does the SSO mean? What does it mean to be a member? What value does membership provide? A strong brand identity can answer these questions. I have the privilege of unveiling our new brand, and as we say in Hollywood, roll them. Dynamic, contemporary, engaging. These words represent the Society of Surgical Oncology and our new brand that symbolizes a culture of leadership and growth. This is SSO, a dynamic global community of cancer surgeons shaping advancements to deliver the highest quality surgical care for cancer patients. SSO promotes leading edge research, quality standards, and knowledge exchange by connecting cancer surgeons worldwide to continuously improve outcomes. Our highly regarded educational events and resources inspire members and spur each cancer surgeon to grow, improve, and thrive. We use the words leading together to position SSO as the organization leading the surgical oncology profession, as well as leading members to increasing levels of achievement and excellence. It also highlights the vitality of our global community of cancer surgeons and our collective approach to new programs new research, new solutions, and new advancements. Our new brand reflects the passion, diligence, and dedication of cancer surgeons and our never-ending commitment to improve cancer care. To learn more about the new SSO brand and what we stand for, visit surgeonc.org. The SSO's new brand emphasizes our leadership strengths and projects our open, inclusive, and forward-thinking culture. The brand also illustrates our global community and our collective desire for new programs, new solutions, and new advancements. We use the words leading together to reflect our position as the organization of like-minded members working together and leading the profession. I believe this is an exciting time to be a member of the SSO. Surgical oncology is evolving. Our membership demographics are changing. Just look around. The SSO must strategically prepare for tomorrow. Those of you who've been members for many years have seen the society grow and change into an efficient, self-managed organization. 
Your loyalty and leadership have served us and the profession well. Please continue to support the SSO and this strategic plan. But this plan will have the most impact and meaning for our young members. We need your energy, passion, and commitment to carry this organization and the profession forward. Change can be hard. It can be resisted. But it is inevitable. A quote often miscredited to Darwin may say it best, the species that survives is not necessarily the strongest, but the most adaptable. Our path will no doubt be influenced by chance and serendipity, but it will create new opportunities with more transparency, inclusivity, and progress. Our society has a vision for the future. Leading together, we will achieve our mission to improve cancer care worldwide. Leading together, we will create the future of surgical oncology. Thank you for this tremendous honor and for your attention.